It is 5.30 p.m. and I will call to order the January 21st, 2020 meeting of the MISD Board of Trustees. Thanks everyone for coming. As is our custom, we will begin with a moment of silence followed by the pledge to the U.S. flag and the Texas flag. Before doing so, I'd like to introduce you to the student who will lead us in those pledges. Uh, that student is Lee High School sophomore Chase Cunningham. Chase is a cadet in the Lee High Air Force Junior ROTC. He is involved with a variety of community service projects. Just last fall, he volunteered his time at the Crestview Cemetery, placing hundreds of flags on graves of our fallen so heroes prior to Veterans Day. He also participated with the annual laying of Christmas wreaths across America, honoring and remembering our veterans. Chase is currently taking biology, geometry, English II, and world history in his core classes. After he graduates from Lee High School, Chase plans on enlisting in the United States Air Force. Thank you, Chase. First, everyone please join me in a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the U.S. flag. Oh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one indivisible. Thank you, Chase, and we wish you the very best in your academic and your career in the Air Force. All right. Uh, next, agenda item number two, presentations, recognitions, awards, or announcements. Do we have any of those this evening? Uh, yes, we do, President Davis. Just want to recognize that the flower arrangements that you do have on your table are in reference to Board Appreciation Month, which is the month of January. Those flower arrangements were uh, put together by our floral groups from Midland High and Lee High. So those students who are pursuing that gift have presented that to our Board of Trustees. As well as our culinary young ladies and young men have prepared um, some desserts back when we do a treat for our executive session time. And those desserts are on their behalf as well. Want to get it later than early, you know, got to keep you up. And so that we can um, uh, enjoy what that is from that gift of those students. Board appreciation is a way that we can uh, honor our board of trustees for the countless hours and time that they put into this role, uh, almost a, a second job in that regard. Uh, we appreciate uh, the drivenness that our board has had for our community and the aspect that they've done to recognize um, all the nuances of things that they need to bring to the attention of the community through their lens and through the eyes and ears that they hear from constituents in the their districts. That's a thank you for your hard work and appreciation, and um, that is Board Appreciation Month uh, for January. All right, well, thank you very much. We appreciate the flowers and all the thank you notes. Thank you. Thank you all very much. All right, next we'll turn to public forum, and we have uh, four speakers signed up to address us this, this evening. Uh, the first one is Brandon Hodges, and the topic is collaborative efforts. Mr. Hodges, welcome. How are y'all doing today? I just wanted to address the board real quick and everybody in Midland and kind of run a few words uh, by y'all. West Texas is a special place, and Midland is the lifeblood of West Texas. Our can-do attitude, our strong work ethic, and our strong will has taken the tall city into conversations around the world. We are of the same perspective that these traits will help lead our local education system to a new tomorrow. Throughout this fall and winter, we have not just seen division and argument, but we've also seen diverse perspectives and collaboration among a variety of voices. Although we may disagree on the specifics of this failed bond, we're in full agreement our best days are ahead with instilling the fire and passion of lifelong learning in our Midland students. There is not a disagreement that we need to update schools and build new facilities. There are just different perspectives on the approach. There were no winners in this election, and the only winning, winning any of us should be focused on is our kids. Better Bond for Midland, myself, and supporters look forward to working with everyone in a true collaborative approach 
because we have what it takes to offer our students, parents, teachers, support staff, and citizens the opportunity for our local public schools to be the love light throughout the entire state of Texas. We now come together as Midlanders, as we've always done in the past, to solve problems we are fully capable of solving. The only legacy and the most important legacy any of us should be focused on is the legacy of happy, healthy, and educated children. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Hodges. Next up, Christian Shedwin, Topic the Bond. Mr. Shedwin, welcome. Members of the board, I come to speak to you this evening on behalf of every young person in this community, though I'm not wise with age, I am with my words. And for that, I say I hope that you've learned something over the issue with the bond, as have I. As long as I've been alive, I've never experienced such confusion or abrasion concerning anything with this community. The division you've created over the past nine months between both parties is appalling and more importantly, alarming. A district as a whole should never be at odds so much so that they have nothing on the to-do list gets done. I would have thought that such recognized and educated men would have taken the time out to look at the examples given to them by every other district in the state of Texas. Not only have they genuinely showed interest in the community, but they have also included the community every step of the way with their children's future and the school's future. You gentlemen have pushed us aside and completely ignored everything these educators, mothers, fathers, and young community members as myself have said in the dealings with this bond. Each and every time one of us came here to talk, he completely ignored us and pretended as though what we had to say wasn't important or necessary to the success or completion of your schools. When in fact, we have had more dealings with these schools day in and day out, but we also go, just, go with just about every single extracurricular activity the district has to offer. Who better to ask what we need or want than the people who sit in the classroom every day? You further continue to insult our knowledge, experience, and intelligence by almost completely ignoring every question we asked. Meanwhile, the questions we were action asking were not only valid, but were the common questions necessary for the completion of your project. The learning lesson I, I get from this is in this experience is that at least on a local political level, my vote counts 100%. You completely underestimated the power of no. I think you now understand that backfired. And let us not forget the maintenance budget used to purchase the land that we have no idea what to do with. But I guarantee if you hadn't informed us of your purchase or asked our opinion, you wouldn't be out of pocket millions of dollars from an account that's supposed to be used to fix the problems that you have no idea are going on these campuses, or more custodial staff, or new te te textbooks in the foreign language department, or something as simple as enough paper for students to be able to write on their own tests. It's appalling that my alma mater, Lee High School, has had to pump out and dry the carpets in the band hall orchestra rooms after a flooding instead of them being replaced. Or how about the fact that the gas lines and sinks don't work in the science labs? Are you more concerned with your new buildings taking care of and upholding the ones you already have that are lacking in several er areas, including teaching staff? I strangely caution you as we go forward with anything concerning students or future bonds to incorporate us as a community or you will continue to get the response that you've seen progress through this election season. People who don't feel heard don't respond. People who don't feel included or important get set aside with your ambushment that you have attempted. This is coming from a place of complete love, structure, respect, and care for the school system. 80 plus years of teaching experience runs through my blood but also pushes me forward to become an educator myself. Respectfully, with that being said, I hope that going forward we can all learn and understand that if we don't come together, the common goal we all want will fail and be incomplete, and we as a community will be in the same place we are now. Thank you. Right. Mr. Shedwin, thank you. Next up, Matt Galindo. Topic, comment made at last meeting. Mr. Galindo, welcome. <coughs> Good evening. I just wanted to uh, make a comment about some comments that were made in our last meeting regarding parents uh, needing to get off the sidelines and get into uh, the action of what's going on that were made by the superintendent and also uh, by comments that were made by the board as regard to being uninformed and parents being uninformed, misinformed, and not knowing what they're talking about. Um, you should know, everybody knows that there's not a single person that does not care about their children. There's not a single time that there's a, how can I put this? I need to be careful on how I say things. Um, it's frustrating when, when a parent comes up and is asking questions and wanting to get answers and they're not only ignored, but they're also made to seem like they don't know what they're talking about. To say that a parent is uninvolved or on the sideline is absolutely ridiculous. There's parents like me that are working 90 hours a week to provide for our families. We're the first, pre the, I'm the first person that my children see when they wake up and the last ones that they see when they go to sleep. 
I am everything and anything that these children need. And now I'm going to be the one who, has, who speaks up for them. And what I'm asking is that the board members would join in in communicating better with us as parents. Us parents are going to be here long after y'all are gone. Long after this board is gone, long after this superintendent is gone, we will still be here. We want the exact same thing you want. The only thing is we would like to be, we would like to be involved in what's going on. The idea of a person that represents a district to say that we're uninformed, uninformed, could it be that you choose not to inform us? That you choose to go out, not go out of your way to reach a community? Could it be that you don't answer your phone calls or your emails? I'm still waiting for a response, but that's what we have. So hopefully at least three more will join me in November to make a change. Because it's absolutely ridiculous to come to a board meeting and have board members complain and, and superintendents make certain comments when a, when a parent comes up to speak. All we're doing is what the board members that ran in 2016 said, you're gonna hold the superintendent and each other accountable, and that's what we're doing. So hopefully we're able to work together in this rather than think that y'all, I mean, y'all y'all voted in, y'all know what y'all are doing, right? We have no idea what's going on. I think we should have a say, and we do have a say. And I think come November, you're gonna hear us. Thank you. All right, Mr. Glenda, thank you. And our last speaker is Meg, Megan McMurray. The topic is accountability, transparency of rights and procedures. Ms. McMurray, welcome. So we meet again, school board. The last time I was here with my attorneys in June, y'all completely dismissed the claims I had. But I'm here to tell you that 13 jurors immediately found me not guilty and were furious with MISD. One of my jurors is actually one of your employees at Central Office. The officer also testified that she did openly discuss everything at ABEL, which is a clear defamation claim. MISD robbed my family of 15 months. It's crazy that we open with the Pledge of Allegiance, but my husband was serving our country in Syria, defending your rights, our rights, and everyone in this world's rights, right? But for four hours, Lieutenant Kevin Bruner and Alex Weaver repeatedly denied my daughter a phone call. I challenge each and every one of y'all to go watch that body cam footage. I guarantee you, you will be furious if you have a child. Because that is her constitutional right. When a minor asks to call a parent, you immediately stop and you let them make that phone call. My husband called my daughter 108 times that day. And was repeatedly, she was not allowed to answer the phone. Nor did Bruner, nor did Weaver ever call me or my husband for four hours. I promise you, Jennifer Cyber was a witness to it who clearly violated the handbook that says a principal will contact a parent if a child is being questioned unless there's a valid objection. Bruner lied in his affidavit. That was proven in court. I spent four days of my life in trial last week to have my jurors hug my neck afterwards and tell me I'm an amazing mother with amazing children. I challenge you all, go watch the body cam footage. I guarantee you, Bruner probably won't have a job after you watch it. If you saw how he treated my child, who was not even enrolled in your district. And let me tell you why my children don't attend this district. I've worked in some of the top international schools in the world. Dubai, Kuwait, India, China. I've never in my life seen a more debacle of public education. Never in my life. There needs to be a complete overhaul of this district and it starts at the top. Because y'all completely dismissed my claims in June instead of going and investigating and knowing what is going on behind closed doors. MISD has some amazing educators. But you know what? The bad always outweighs the good in this district. 
And that's why you can't keep good educators. I quote Jeff Horner the day, the week before this happened. Dr. Cyber thinks the world of you. They did not want me to take the job overseas. I have impeccable evaluations, had never been written up, and completely transformed A. Bell Junior High. But look what y'all did to my family, my husband, serving our country. My daughter is still in therapy to this day for what Bruner did to her and Weaver. So I challenge y'all, go watch the body cam footage. Because it will be revealed in court coming up. This is not over. MISD will be held accountable for what you did to my family and the 15 months you robbed of me. Thank you. Ms. McMurray, thank you. All right, moving forward on our item agenda number four, the consent agenda. 4A, board meeting minutes on page 9 of the meeting packet. 4B, monthly financials, page 15. 4C, budget amendment, page 27. 4D, monthly expenditures, page 30. 4E, monthly investment report, page 48. 4F, contracts over $100,000, page 55. 4G Encore Easement for First Tee at Gill Complex, The Boneyard, page 59. 4H RFP 19-09, Landscaping Parts, Supplies, Equipment, and Landscaping Maintenance, page 63. 4I RFP 19-13, Energy Management Parts, Supplies, Equipment, and Repair Services, page 66. And 4J Personnel Appointments, page 70. Board members, or do any of these consent agenda items need to be pulled for any reason? Four G is pulled. Any others? All right. Hearing none, then four A, B, C, D, E, F, H, I, and J will be deemed approved by consent. Returning to 4G, Encore Easement for First Tee at Gill Complex, the Boneyard. Mr. Truschetti? I just, I was just wondering if Mr. Riggin give us an update. There was a lot of fanfare when this announcement was made, just kind of where this is in the timeline, what we see kind of, you know, as this prog project progresses, kind of where we are. Uh, this progress uh, is progressing uh, with the uh, uh, renovations and the use by First Tee of the existing uh, driving range and the uh, uh, chipping, uh, uh, chipping greens in back and then the large green. Uh, this easement is specifically uh, to uh, uh, provide power to the new pump house that they've installed that replaces the existing uh, well uh, uh, tank, holding tank, and they put a pressurized tank on the site and, and put pumps into three existing well, new pumps into three existing wells on property so that they can start watering uh, those um, tea boxes that they are, the, the, the green, the tea boxes, uh, uh, chipping greens, and the uh, driving range. So they are moving forward, yes. Any other questions for Mr. Riggins? Motion. motion by Mr. Truschetti. Second. Second by Mr. Murray. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous, Mr. Kennedy is, uh, has health issue this evening and he is not in attendance. The rest of the board members vote in favor of it. 4G passes. All right, next is our public hearing on our 2018-2019 annual performance report. The information begins on page 75 in the meeting packet, and I believe there's a PowerPoint presentation. Welcome. It is now, I'll call to order the hearing. Uh, it is now 5.49 p.m. Thank you. Good evening, President Davis, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Riddick. I'm happy to be here this evening to present on our annual performance report for our district for the 2018-2019 academic year. I do want to mention before uh, I begin that this is a year in review report, so a lot of the information that I'm going to be sharing this evening has already been shared, reviewed, and discussed with our campus and district leaders, and likewise corresponding actions for improvements uh, have already been taken. So 
So Texas Education Code requires that the components that you see listed in this slide before you are included in our district annual performance report. I will take you through each one of these components and I will begin with the 2018-2019 Texas Academic Performance Report or TAPER. So the data that you're looking at right here in this slide is STAR 20, 2019 data for all tested subjects and for all grades tested. It is also data that is broken down further by the percent of students that performed at each one of the STAR performance thresholds. So beginning at the bottom, you see the approaches, the approaches grade level threshold. What this means is that our kiddos that are performing at this level of performance have some level of knowledge of the content and skills, but they still lack some critical skills that they will need to be successful in the next grade or course. So these kiddos will need additional support as they move on to the coming year. You can see that the percentage of students that performed at this grade level, performance level, was 68% for our district. The next performance threshold in STAR is the meets grade level performance. So our kiddos that are performing in this level of performance means that these students have strong content knowledge and skills, and these students are ready to move on to the next, to progress to the next grade level or course. You can see that 39% of our students fell in that performance level. Next is the third performance threshold in STAR, the master's performance level. This means that students have mastery of the course content, knowledge, and skills, and these kiddos are on track for college and career readiness. 17% of our students performed in this level. The question, or do you want to wait till the end? Uh, I'll be ready to take any questions you, at this you just time. Define, I understand district and state. Will you give me a better definition of what region is? Is that like our TEA region? Are you talking about just the Permian Basin? That would be just Permian Basin region. That's what I was going. It would just be in this area. Okay. okay, so on the next slide, the TAPER report also provides us with information on graduation and college career readiness, or CCMR. You can see that our graduation rate, this is for the class of students that graduated in 2018, our graduation rate was 90.4. The bottom graph shows our CCMR rates for students also in the class of 2018. You can see our percentages listed there. There is ongoing and current work that we are doing to equal what this would look like as compared to the state. Additional reporting components of the taper include performance indicators for state assessment performance and for attendance and post-secondary readiness. Listed here are 13 performance indicators under these categories. These are indicators or areas that we as a district report out to the state and that we as a district get evaluated on. In addition, the taper also provides us with a district profile, a profile of student demographics and program percentage participation information. The slide that you see here, the data that you see here in front of you, is our district program participation percentages for our district as it compares to the state. So, sorry. Yes, sir. So that graph is saying that 60% of the state is considered economically disadvantaged, but in our district only 47% is? Yes, sir. And that is solely based on free and reduced lunch? Yes, sir. And the same with English language learners, we only have 12.6% in MISD? Yes, compared to 195 for the state, this is for the 2018-2019 school year. So I'll give you a moment to go through the remainder of the numbers. On this next slide, the taper report provides us also with various pieces of staff information. This slide shows also a district to state 
comparison of the percent of our teachers by years of experience in the 2018-2019 school year. 2018-2019 school year. You can see in this graph that compared to the, we're pretty comparable to the state, pretty comparable or equal to in the state in just about every area. One area in which we're not pretty comparable or equal to the state is in our percentage of beginning teachers. And, and beginning teachers is first year? That would be yes. just brand new starting teachers. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, the same is true for teachers 11 to 20 years experience too. Mm -hmm. Like the margin is greater there than it is at the beginning. But. Go ahead. Yes, sir. On the next slide. Additional reporting requirements include our district accreditation status and our campus performance objectives. So our district was assigned an accreditation status of accredited for the school year of 2018-2019. In addition, within your board packets, we included uh, the campus performance objectives for the 2018-2019 school year, which were also included in the campus improvement plans. These uh, campus performance objectives have already been updated to reflect the, the current school, uh, the current needs of the school year at the campuses, and these were approved and reviewed by you, our board. Um, they were approved in November. Additional information is um, now that I'm going to report on is PIMS financial standard reports information. So here what you're seeing is, is actually uh, information on PIMS financial report, which we also included in your packets. This is information from the 2017-2018 school year. So this essentially reflects the district's financial status for that year. Also, this financial report was also audited in the fall of 2018. Our CFO, as you know, monthly provides us and the public with financial updates and most current and most recent uh, financial information that reflects the status of our district. On this next slide, it's a report on violent and criminal in criminal incidents. Sorry about that. So the state requires that we um, also share annually. Sorry, let me go on to the next slide. So this you're seeing here a report on violent and criminal incidents for the 2018-2019 school year. The state requires us that we share annually information on the number of incidents with disciplinary action codes considered or under the category of criminal, criminal and violent incidents. One example of a disciplinary or an incident like this would be possession of a firearm, possession of an illegal knife. Another example would be possession of a controlled substance. So the chart that you see before you, you can see for our district, we had a total of 10 incidents that fell under the, these disciplinary action codes. Percentage-wise, for our student population, we had 0.04% uh, of incidents that were reported under these disciplinary action codes. I've broken it down further for you to the student level according to elementaries, junior highs, and high schools. Respectively, you can see the number of incidents at each level. And last is a report from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board on student performance in post-secondary institutions. So the report that you see here before you is a report from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. If you go to the far right, um, I know that it's very hard to see, but if you go to the far right, it's a list of our students that graduated in the year of 2016-2017 school year. 
for each one of our camp for each one of our high schools and moved on to enroll in an institution of higher ed in the state of Texas. Overall, when we look at this information overall as a district, we had a total of 217 students that went on to enroll at a four-year public university. Overall as a district, we also had a total of 385 students who enrolled in a two-year public college. Under each one of our high schools, you see a category that is called not trackable or not found. What this means, students that were not found or not, not trackable, these are students that for that specified year when this data was provided were not found to be at an institution of higher ed. It also accounts for the students that may have enrolled in an, at an institution of higher ed outside of the state of Texas. So I'm here asking, Mr. Reddick, do we have, so each, each military service has a, uh, a college, you know, that the, the guys sometimes, are, some, of, some of the military people enroll, that's not counted on here, is it? That one, I don't, I'm not sure that the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board pulls in um, academies, military academies, because they do reside outside the state of Texas. Um, and private universities sit out there and that would be considered an example of one. So they would not oh, okay. be inclusive inside of that. So if a student went to OU, as near as it is, that student would not be in the collection of data and information on top of that. Or if they went to a technical college outside of the state of Texas, they would not be included in the data as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, this concludes my presentation on our district's annual performance report. This presentation, as well as our district taper report, will be posted on our district's accountability webpage. Um, in addition, we will provide paper copies that we'll, we will make available for our public and our parents, our community, um, in each floor for the administration building. We will also facilitate the process of posting each one of the campus tapers in um, on our campus websites for each one of our schools and we will also make available our campuses our schools will make available um, campus taper uh, copies at the front office for our public and parents to view if you have any questions at this time I'll be happy to answer any questions so I'll be happy to invite my team to come up and answer any questions that you might have for me at this time I'm going to ask one question. It's, it's on the fourth page of the slide presentation on the uh, college career mil military ready. We're tra we're failing or we're trailing both of the the region and the state. How do we track uh, the students that go directly into a career? Because it seems like to me, and out here we would have we would, our number would be higher because we do have so many ch uh, students going on to work in the oil field or, for instance, in industry. So how do we track those students? So I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Horner to share information on that. I do know that we receive information from Workforce Commission in addition and other sources that Mr. Horner could probably speak to. So I'd like to invite him to come up, please. Yes, sir. And just to answer your question directly, we don't, um, and the state does not. So um, it is that slide does show us uh, falling slightly behind on CCMR rate. Um, quite simply, they measure two-year, four-year. Um, military does count in there, but if you go in into the career, if you go directly into uh, uh, out of the Petroleum Academy and work in Concho, it does not count. So you're not you're you're um, you actually hurt our percentage in that situation. So the state has specific targets that they use to, for that college and career criteria. Um, although that is a great career where someone's been prepped and ready to go in at a fundamental level, level into Concho or other um, oil and gas industries that we prepped them for, we would not receive credit for them entering into the career field, although it does say college and career. Uh, there's coursework that we would get credit for for those students that they had taken prior to um, entering into the career that the state would give us credit for, which is a dual credit course that they would do at Midland College. But in regards to the graduation, at that point in time, uh, we would not get credit for a number of our kids who do go into very good careers that we've prepared them for. 
Right, so there's about 11 indicators or so that Mr. Riddick just mentioned that would fall under the category of college career military readiness. Some of them also include industry-based certifications or level one or level two certifications. And so those would probably fall under the, those do fall under college, career, and military. Right. And if I just may elaborate, the, the, the career portion, the way it's calculated, um, and this indicator is those students that actually get a certification that's on the state approved list. Um, and that state approved list doesn't include many, many programs such as our Millen College welding program, for example, is not on the state approved list. So there's uh, some of the discrepancy is, is um, based on what that uh, approval list is. So we're working to get about more and more on that approval list and, uh, and with our organizations like Mellon College to uh, make sure that they um, supply the industry certification test that results in that list. Um, but that, if it's not on the industry approved list, then it doesn't necessarily count, so. Thank you. Can you go back to the slide with the on the, the economically disadvantaged English language learners, career technical education. Slide six. I mean, I, I have it in front of me. I'll just use. Let me, um, I'll go back here. So I, I guess my either question or concern or comment would be is that I, I have a hard time believing knowing, you know, how we struggle with that on the campus level that only 47% are economically disadvantaged. That is based upon the reporting. So if you have parents that aren't filling out the free and reduced lunch paperwork, that is not reflected in that statistic. That was a question, not a statement. Yes, sir. If we're not, if, if our parents are not filling out those income surveys, so those uh, surveys that you mentioned, uh, those free and reduced lunch surveys, if they're not filling it out, then we don't have a basis to inform or to report to the state the how they fall under the econ economically disadvantaged. So is there a similar metric or measure for the English language learners? Because I'm with Mr. Murray that that number, at least knowing our demographics in the district, seems low to me. There is a process that we follow for English language learners. If I can invite our executive director of bilingual and ESL to come, come up. Ms. That is based on a language survey to identify our English language learners, but I'll have Ms. Amaya elaborate a little bit more. So there is um, a process that's state mandated. And so for every student who enrolls in a public school, uh, they have to fill out what we call a home language survey. And if there is a language stated other than English, we test the students and based on that, uh, we determine whether or not they're eligible. So just because we have a language other than English listed, doesn't always mean that the student will qualify. I can tell you though, that these numbers are last years. I'm telling you, this year we're probably at approximately 14%. Uh, we do, we are, every single day, we enroll families. Um, it is not a guarantee that they will qualify. Let me remind you that our, our population is coming, it's no longer just coming from um, Mexico, which is what our, our old trend. We have people from Venezuela, Nigeria. Last week we had someone from Italy. And so the, our, our population is really a lot more diverse. And, and I didn't know this, but there's a lot of um, uh, other countries who offer English um, as, as, you know, English is, um, you know that, as a universal language. And so a lot of our students are coming already equipped. Last year, last week, Trinity was trying to steal three or four of our, our kids. So anyway, it, it is a, um, we're trying not to let them steal them because when they come with three or four languages, they're going to excel, but they might still steal them. But anyway, uh, we our population this year has increased. Um, this reflects the last year's numbers. Any other questions? That's figuratively. They're recruiting students of talent, and we do have students of talent that they do want, as well as many others. <laughs> Jeff? I had, I had a clarifying question for Jeff on the, so the, um, the welding part, for example, talking about welding, but, so is that a, a, 
is it is it a, is it a process that the student doesn't have enough time in high school to get a higher level certificate with welding, and, and, or is it a matter of fact, or is it a more of an institutional issue with uh, accreditation for on the Midland College side? That, I'd like to answer that by saying both. Um, our first issue is with separate ninth grade campuses. We do struggle in getting students in a pathway, not just a petroleum academy or health science academy, but we struggle because of the difference in campuses and having to split staff between those. Um, we are not as good as we should be in a perfect aligned pathway. Right. So that's my first answer um, portion. The second is the college does um, Although they have a skills-based program, it is uh, it does not result in that test that's approved by the state, and you have to lobby in front of the state to get on that list. And so um, we're working to merge that and either get uh, their programs on the list or vice versa to, to have Millen College um, assessed. Because really, if we had if we hadn't started in ninth grade and finished through in the twelfth grade, the time is there. Um, but that gap in ninth grade causes us uh, just enough to give us that hiccup in between and then just being on the appropriate list. And welding is a good example, but there are many others like that. Our health science, for example, um, just about every certification that we go through on the health science academy um, or those health science courses are approved on the state list. Um, that's because it's a more common practice. Uh, there, there are very specialized welding that's on the list that the uh, Mellon College gives more of a general skills-based course. Right, right. Oh, wait, uh, no, yeah, it's, American welders are in high demand everywhere, so so it's uh, something that's uh, hold, held in high regard uh, abroad that they'd be specialized on, on mo there's multiple skill levels in there, so. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you for that report. And now the, the remainder of the public hearing is to hear from anyone who would like to address the board about this report this evening. As, a, as she said, that the report is posted on our website. Seeing no one come forward, then uh, it is 6, 12 p.m. and we will conclude the hearing uh, on the 2018-2019 annual performance report and move to agenda item 6, our district report, 6A is our board goals, constraint progress measure 1.1. Mr. Horner, welcome. Good evening, Superintendent Reddy, President Davis, board members. I am presenting to you uh, Superintendent Constraint 1.1 under the board goals. This is a constraint that has uh, gone under revision uh, back in fall of 2018. It was the first time we changed the uh, format of how we measure this. Essentially, we use a PLC implementation rubric, and the highest level of scoring on the rubric is at a refined or internalized measure. Um, so our goal is to have 100% of our campus teams to either score a three or a four, which is the refined or internalized, or um, if they have not scored a three or four, that they show improvement by at least one level by the end of the year. So that's the way the goal is, uh, was adjusted a year ago. So in fall of 2019, we um, worked with over 200 teams in the district measuring this constraint um, and getting a basis uh, base, baseline on where we are from a team standpoint. Um, out of over 200 teams, in fall of 2019, our um, rating was 24%. Um, this is compared to fall of 18 of 18%. Now I'll remind you this is a process report, not necessarily a progress report on um, the end of your goal. The end of your constraint measure will actually be measured or reported in June, but the best way we're able to uh, determine uh, where we are is, is actually how many teams um, are at a full three or four. So we are proud of the increase. Uh, we know last year we, we, um, we were right on target of the, of the annual target, um, knowing that 18% is where we started with. 
So again, in fall of 18, using the new metric, and I won't go into the difference between the old and the new, and I'll just, but I will clarify the reason there is no connection between 16, 17, report of three, 17, 18, report of 18, there's no connection between the two because we changed, uh, changed the format of how we were reporting. But in fall of uh, 18, we were at 18%, and fall of 19, we were at 24%. So this information gives us uh, good information on where we are, what teams we're working with, in order to uh, work with the remaining 75% remaining of teams in order to show progress in order to meet the superintendent constraint uh, 1.1. Does that answer any questions or clarification? So, I mean, um, so we, you know, that's been, we've had a lot of conversation about this. So what, what, because uh, this one's got a lot of, seems like a lot of in and out to it, but what, you know, because it was, it was one of the things was that, you know, if you got the new person in, the, you know, timeline for them to catch up and all that, what's, is there still, do we have something we can identify that's kind of holding everything kind of back? Well, I can tell you after monitoring the data, after looking at um, all 200 plus teams, um, generally speaking, the teams that had the larger teams, and, and generally that's in secondary where we may have six, seventh grade teachers, you know, on a team. The teams that have the larger te teams have trended towards uh, meeting threes and fours um, earlier on in the year. The teams where we have a lot of turnover or where they're a smaller team, um, that turnover does have a factor in not being able to um, reach that three or four. So um, just an observation, but I think it's an answer to your question, is that turnover does impact it. Um, and the size of the team generally is the trend that we're seeing. Um, the less turnover, the more chances that, that they're already starting at that three or four level. So I know there's some, some groups that are specialized, like, uh, and I don't want to put anybody out there, but like this, I'm just going to pick one. But to say math, you know, there would be a, a, a would that impact? Because I know, I know there was that talk about getting this campus and this campus, because there's maybe not that many math teachers or something like that. Yes, sir. Is that um, so we have collaborative PLCs that work across the district. And um, directors and executive directors and principals even work with those collaboratives to to work collaboratively across the district and then bring that communication and that planning back to that district or that campus PLC. Unfortunately, because the uh, the way the uh, uh, progress measure is is worded, the district level of those PLCs we don't uh, we don't calculate or tap them. That would be an example like a physics teacher or a calculus teacher who may sit in few numbers and have to collaborate across the district in order to weave through that, that project uh, for math and internalize that way. So that becomes, we want them to do that because there are not many of them and collaborate that way. Most often they'll do vertical collaboration, um, but that's another element of, of planning uh, and Jeff, is vertical uh, collaboration a part of the PLC rubric? It, it is possible to be measured. So when we, um, when we, when we report back on a team, um, as long as they can answer the four questions of the, of the PLC work, uh, it is likely that a, a vertical team, um, it may be a um, sixth and seventh, uh, an eighth grade math group is meeting that that is, um, it is reported and recorded, yes sir. So vertical is possible. Generally speaking, the teams that uh, we see, and I, just from uh, secondary, you know, being in there daily, or I would say daily, being in there more regularly, they're generally horizontal uh, teams. But to answer your question, it is possible for a vertical team or a team to be a vertical group of, you know, third, fourth, and fifth grade math team. And just to share with, with our community, um, our PLC is our professional learning community. It's our teacher coming together to learn amongst their peers and colleagues. There are four areas of evaluation, meaning you're either learning, you're literal, you're refined, or you're internalized. 
and it's one, two, three, four in a scoring. We score a number of areas for that professional learning community. We score their collaborative culture. We score a guaranteed curriculum um, and establishing what students need to learn and how they learn what they learn. We score on a common assessment, how we build and create and collaborate and, and bring that together. We ensure learning in a way that educators respond when some students have not learned it, what do we do next? And then we ensure on an enriching uh, learning environment. So those five areas are numbered through the four areas and we want people to get to internalize. And uh, when you think through turnover at small groups, because some teams can only ex may only exist with two team members, what that could look like. And you heard Mr. Horner reference teams that are big as six or seven. Thank you for that. Thank you. Sir. Well, I'm uncertain what, looking at that constraint progress measure, and I know that we revise this to show at least one level of growth on the other elements so that we could take into account the practical challenge when you do have turnover within the subject level teachers that are participating in the PLCs but this you're going to the next slide or the the one that shows the the graph the Are, are the are the target numbers of the target for the beginning of the year or they are target numbers for the end of the year yes sir, that's, a, that's a great question um, so the way this uh, constraint is measured and the way we rewarded it is um, we evaluate the teams in the fall so October, we finished uh, evaluating teams on the, using the Ruger. Teams, uh, teams had a, a self-evaluation monitored by the principal and then the executive director of that group. And that team ranks himself, uh, or ranks them on that uh, Ruger. Because the constraint measure is the, um, those that score a three or a four, or show growth, we're not able to show growth because Essentially, the number you see there, the 24%, is our baseline for the fall. So out of those that were not already a three or four, we're going to be looking in May, we're going to look to see, all right, you were a two, did you increase by one um, in order to count? So those that are three or fours still will count. And then those that um, rated, we look literally at 100% of those uh, ratings to see if you went from a two to a three or a one to a two. And that, that particular caveat is exactly uh, what we put in place to deal with the fact that we have turnover. So, the, so to answer your question, the 24% um, is not connected at all because the goal is to have those number of campuses with 100% of their teams. So we will report in June how many campuses have the 100% um, of their teams meet that constraint. This one is simply how many teams are already at a three and four. Okay, so. Who? Is that, wait, 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 wait. The, the, are these numbers campuses or percentages? This, this, is, sim this is a number of teams um, because literally we have uh, maybe one campus already at that uh, at that ratio because of that turnover level. So if we were to report out um, the number of number, we don't have a way to show growth. And so um, that's why it's a percentage of teams. All right, so let me go back. What, what's the blue, what's the blue? So the blue is the overall percentage of teams that are at the refined or internalized level of 100%. Where did those numbers in blue come from? So we, um, it, it's a, because that's, that's the target. That's the target, right? No, so the, the, the blue square is literally where we are as fall. And then the um, number 35, that will, our, our constraint measure will be how many campuses have 100% um, of their teams that meet that. So 35 in June is the number of campuses, campuses. that we're targeting. Right. And 24% is the percentage of teams 
Uh, and, and I'm saying that because it is not possible to measure the number of campuses because the constraint shows growth measuring fall compared to spring. So we included, I'm, I'm lost. One of the things that we did was we looked for what Trustee Marquez was referencing is if you lose a team member and you have to start all over again, what could that look like for what could uh, look, look, how can you recognize growth? So we said we need that component was not in there. So you're seeing two different things measured on the slide. You're seeing the number of schools. And then what we're looking at is if we're going to look at also number of schools as well as growth, what Jeff is referencing is this is what it looks like for threes or fours. And then in the, in the spring, we will bring this data back to you as well as what growth looks like and then give you the number of campuses that have met uh, that expectation. So the, the numbers in blue our schools are campuses. Correct. Correct. So and 35 the number is the in target. Orange, those the numbers 18 and 24 in orange yes. are not campuses. Correct. They're percentage of teams yes. that have achieved a three or a four. Yes. Correct. And then what we'll do in the spring is we will sustain the threes and fours and then see did we have twos go to threes, ones go to twos we will look at what growth could look like on a team because there's been that much turnover that we need to think through uh, based on a teacher change subject or grade levels, uh, a teacher is new to the grade level, uh, meaning a new hire, new employee. Uh, so we're assessing what all that looks like as he's building that number up. So he, he can give you last year's number right here and say last year we were at this point and then come back in the spring and say, okay, we've moved from this point to this point in between, but we're trying to figure out what's the work that we need to go do in regards to teams hitting those four areas around all those topics that I, I shared earlier. All right, so the, the good news is, now that I've, we need to work on that slide for next time and identify them, but the, the blue represents campuses that have achieved the constraint progress measure that we reestablished at the for the 1819 year, which is either three or four, 100 percent. We want at the end of the school year, every single campus to have achieved either a three or four on the PLC rubric, or at least shown at least one level of, of growth on that rubric. Yes. And that latter one is to account for the change and the problems and challenges it causes to achieve or three or four otherwise. But we give them credit for for getting better. All right. So, on the good news is, as I, as I think I'm now understanding it, is that this time last year, 18% of our teams achieved a three or a four. 100% in the fall, yes sir. And the good news is, is that, that the number of, the percentage of teams that have achieved a three or four, this same time this year, as compared to last year, has gone up 6%. Correct. And what this does not show uh, because it cannot show is those teams that will improve by one level on the rubric between the October baseline and the end of the year uh, survey or exactly. evaluation. Yes, sir. Okay. And I'll add, um, we'll use this set of data that was collected, the 24%, all those threes and fours, the teams. We'll use the data collected in the fall to measure again in June uh, with the second assessment, a second rubric collection to determine those that showed not only the three and four, but then we're able to show the growth in June. So um, in 18, 19, our target was 27 campuses. In the fall of 18, we had 18% of our campuses um, had 100% threes and fours. So fall of 19, where our uh, measurement is 24%, our baseline, um, or, or for the fall anyway, and our target is we're at the full three year implementation. Um, so our target is uh, 35 campuses at the end of 1920. All right, I'm glad to see the progress because uh, I think this is one of the critical core ways this district can improve itself and become the district it wants to be district wide is to, is to implement this with integrity. And, all across the board, at least show improvement for those that have experienced turnover. So, yes, and we do appreciate the uh, change in wording because it does give us opportunity to uh, to meet it. 
Jeff, I've got one more question. So, so the per, so uh, silly question there, but the, if you're at a four, you know, if you're at a four already, how does that get accounted to? How do they get credit? Because we reach four, and that's it. There's no more growth in four, right? Yes, sir. Um, so, because we worded it at a three or a four or so growth. Then, if they're at a three or a four, they meet that. Um, they meet that standard. Okay. So if they're at a four, they count as a yes. Okay. I think I knew that already, but I don't care about it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, 6B, Innovation Update. That's a report only on page 195 of our meeting packet, unless you have any questions for Ms. Kale regarding the information contained in that report. All right, hearing no questions, we'll turn to 6C, Financial Update, page 190, 198 of the meeting packet. Ms. Moss, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Riddick and trustees, um, December marked our sixth month of the current fiscal year, uh, ending in uh, June of 20. We ended that month with $109 million in cash and short-term investments uh, for all funds. Our year-to-date revenue exceeds our year-to-date expenditures by $21.4 million in the general operating fund and our interest rates range from 1.25 to 1.86 percent in December. Interest earned for all funds totaled $139,000 bringing that year-to-date total to just over a million dollars for interest. Year-to-date tax, M&O tax collections totaled $160.7 million or about 30.8 percent of the revised budget. Collections are slightly down compared to December of last year, uh, roughly about 3%. Um, however, we monitor those collections on a three-year average, and um, on that current average, we are uh, basically on target for that. For our 1920 uh, budget, just a couple of highlights for that. Uh, just want to point out that our recapture, the current estimate is 132.9. 132.9 million. What is that? That is 32% of our budget. Of our budget. And, so, and so. I don't. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so historically, the district has paid recapture in monthly installments. Uh, Mr. Rick and I received today a formal confirmation from the TEA that our request to pay uh, that recapture in one lump sum in August um, was approved. So we'll be able to generate some um, interest on, on those dollars this year. Um, and for 2019-20 and the 2021 budget, you know, House Bill 3 comes into play. We've talked about that uh, a lot. Our predictability in the past has become uh, a little more challenging, where we currently um, will receive, at the end of this month, our taxable values, our preliminary values from uh, the Comptroller's Office. Typically, we would be using that information for the 2021 budget. That information now is for the the uh, 1920 budget, so we'll uh, probably be running those numbers and sending you some more um, uh, budget amendments. So we talked about that going in, that we would have quite a few this year. I think we're uh, at either our third budget amendment or maybe our fourth, uh, our fourth budget amendment, thank you, Tony, uh, for the year. And so there will be more to come based on the information that comes out of uh, TEA and in regards to House Bill 3. Uh, the commissioner is still working on rules uh, in regards to that, some of the new allotments that are out there and the spending requirements, um, some of those rules have not yet been written. So we are monitoring that and, and, and working uh, on that information for both this year's budget and next year's budget. 
um, specifically to next year's budget. Our human capital department is in the process of staffing meetings for, the, for uh, that budget, and our budget department is currently working on um, working with our campuses to submit their non-salary portion of the budget, which is due later this week. So we're in the routine, um, uh, just as we did last year. I think we do have a budget workshop scheduled for February that's tentative, um, and we'll have Veronica will get with you when we come up with the date. If we hear more information in regards to House Bill 3 and some of those initiatives, we will have one in February. If not, we will uh, move that budget workshop until March. Um, the last item is I uh, just wanted to talk about our bond payment that's coming up next month. It is typically due on the 15th. We'll be due on the 18th because of the holiday this year. Uh, and just a reminder that we are redeeming that series 2011 uh, bond. Um, so our total payment for uh, the regular payment, including principal and interest, is $12.2 million. The 2011 series principal redemption is $10.7 million. Uh, and once we make the payment for that 2011, 2011 series, we'll have a balance of $4.6 million left in that series. That is still callable. And as we monitor our fund balance on the INS side, um, we can determine whether or not we want to um, pay that principal down as well. So that results in a savings for our district and taxpayers of just over $3 million. And we just continue to work on some of our internal um, goals that we have, uh, looking at financial transparency. Um, if you go to our website, we have actually done some updates on there. Um, uh, just want to commend Carla Martin. She has uh, been working on that process. It's been one of our goals for the last couple of years. We finally got to uh, move forward on that. Uh, so we have requested uh, the Texas Comptroller's Office to look at our website now and possibly we will earn those transparency stars that we've been, uh, that's been one of our goals. Um, another uh, point I want to make is I kind of want to commend uh, these two gentlemen. You've seen their names on the financial reports uh, in uh, our executive director's absence. Our budget director, Tony Kingman, is here and he's uh, filled in uh, in her absence. And also Arturo Valenzuela is our controller. He's been working on uh, the financial reports in her absence as well. So, Thank you all very much. Glad to answer any questions that you may have. So, have you have you gotten any questions over the um, um, I'm trying to name the title correctly to the report that came out in the paper showing that all the districts the first report is it the Petroleum Texas Petroleum Association report I think it is it showed have you gotten any questions in reference to that report that came out where it showed uh, the revenue generated by the oil and gas industry. And I'm not for sure what report you're referring to, uh, Where it showed, uh, Mr. Marquez, but I have not received any questions to answer your, uh, your on, question on there. Way. I have not okay. received any questions on that. Okay. Well, uh, uh, some people asked me about it, and it shows on the paper, it shows that Midland was one of the top districts that received the oil and gas, out of the oil and gas sector, um, uh, you know, revenue. Tax revenue? Tax revenue. And uh, so, and it shows, uh, I think, uh, Barstow or Pegas ISD in front of us, you know, and it lists out several other districts here in West Texas. But so that report's a little, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good deal for the oil and gas industry because it shows the type of revenues generated by, by the investment and in infrastructure that's going in and so forth. But, you know, at the same time, it's, just a bit misleading because that money, a lot of it, as we stated earlier, does not stay here. So it goes back to the state of Texas in their form of recapture. Okay, I'll try to look that up and take a look. And one of the things that we did report out was from the county appraisal district, um, minerals and business and industry in regards to uh, property value, what that brings in, and this report could tie in to, as well, uh, the dollars driven in that way, and we shared with our community during our bond time that that was north of 60%, and property value was generated that way so that voters would not put the entire bill 
in regards to the bond, that it was only 40% of what that could look like uh, that voters would have to come up with, that the large share would come from oil and gas. And right. that report that you're referencing sounds very similar in, in that regard. So, okay, well, thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Ms. Moss, I want to ask you, um, and you, you may have said it a while ago and I didn't listen fast enough. Um, so we had this whole House Bill 3 that's kind of changed the way we're doing, and there were some requirements in there about what our teachers, professionals, had to be paid. And so we had a, a raise as part of that process, but then we also talked about in January we would know better about what the numbers really looked like to, to know if our teachers, professional staff, were going to get additional incentives. Do, are we working on those calculations? Do you have an update on that? We do not. Well, I don't have an update for you. However, we're wait, waiting on the commissioner um, on, in that regard as well. Okay. So once we get the information from the TEA and the commissioner in which way, um, you know, what their decisions are, we'll update you on that. Okay. Thank you. One of the things the commissioner has to work through, there is, um, what's the, 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 Grant, Darla, the hold harmless that was given to us this year. The transition grant? The transition grant. So the bill requires that any new money that you receive goes towards, um, a six, uh, is it 60%? Goes towards pay raises. Well, 75. 75% 75 goes towards pay raises. Well, the transition grant was utilized to help districts, recapture districts, not lose as much during this during this time frame. And so they named it a transition grant. One of the things that we brought to his attention is, are you considering that new money? Because if you're considering that new money, that's a lot of money that we will be putting towards teacher pay raises that stay with us into perpetuity, meaning it stays with us forever. And so they're making rules and uh, guidance guidelines around what are they considering as just one aspect, new money, so that uh, we don't put districts, or so the state doesn't put districts in a situation that um, drives them uh, to not be able to pay what they've designed for teacher pay raise increases. I guess along with that same um, idea that we don't know yet, uh, the hold harmless that we received this year and are, and are told we'll get it next year, we don't know anything about going out further than that. No, and, and we'll not probably have any information on that until the next uh, biennium, until the next legislative session, okay. uh, which is why we have actually, you know, we have a budget line item for that, that amount uh, and have not spent that money because, again, we don't know. We may still be held to those teacher salaries, but we may not have the funding to support that. So there's still a lot of unanswered questions, again, in regards to House Bill 3. A lot of positives came out, you know, of school finance and some of the changes that occurred, uh, but still, there uh, uh, it created a lot of challenges for us as well. Uh, the data that we have to submit to uh, TEA um, and, and um, account coding, all those different things uh, come into play that we're working through. Okay, so do, would I be correct if I said our recapture went up to almost $133 million as estimated today, but the hold harmless piece of that is almost $55 million? We have it right now estimated at about 52 Okay. A little over $52 million. Okay, so um, roughly $80 million is what our net recapture is? Yes. Which and is that, Which would be exactly what we were uh, projecting it to be From, prior to House okay. Bill 3. Okay, so really it didn't benefit us at all. It kind of kept us in the same position. Yeah, that's right. Because we were at 65 million last year. Yes. Okay, thank you. He asked my question. Our hold harmless did not apply to us for Robin Hood. It right. is harm. It is harmful. <laughs> Just for the record. But it's there. If it wasn't there, we'd be in a uh, much um, no worse shape, probably. Yeah, but regardless, we're paying the 132, 33. Correct, regardless. Yes. So that is our estimate at this time. Again, we're still looking for you know some answers uh, that may change that number. And uh, as we get those answer answers and plug it into our template, uh, get those adjustments, we'll be coming to you with uh, amendments for the budget. All right, any other questions for Ms. Moss? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. 6D staffing update. Mr. Bailey, welcome. The information on page 201 of the meeting packet. 
Good evening, President David Davis, board members, Superintendent Riddick. Um, my report is not nearly as exciting as Ms. Moss's report, um, but we are, have included some information, detailed information this time of the year in regard to staffing. <coughs> as reported um, on the first slide, you can see that um, we are on trend. Retention, and employee retention is better this year than last year, and monthly averages are on trend with previous year totals. Um, and we will see where that ends up um, toward the end of the year. Personal reasons and other reasons is the main reason for resignation. Um, and these include those pre who presented just cause for resignation and were released from their contract. So those are the leading reasons, of course, um, up to this point. Secondly, I want to take this opportunity to talk um, about an initiative that we will launch in, um, in the 2020-2021 school year. You'll hear a lot of information about opportunity culture, and you'll probably wonder exactly what that means, what we're talking about um, in regard to opportunity culture. And I just want to take a few, min a few minutes to talk about this work that um, we'll support and, and implement this year. Opportunity culture is a collaborative initiative between Hector County ISD and Midland ISD. Eight campus have been identified to launch this initiative beginning um, this school year, Lee High School, Midland Freshman, Rust, Scarborough, Days of Allah, South, Yarborough, and Emerson. And basically, um, Opportunity Culture is um, an initiative that's supported by some private foundations as well as um, some, it will require some, some local funding to um, address teacher shortages that are across our area as well as been, um, it's been proven to be successful in other areas of the nation. It gives new teachers a jump start into the profession with paid teacher residencies. And this is in partnership with the University of Texas of the Permian Basin. <coughs> this provides campus administrators on these eight campuses and innovative structure to maximize on the talents of those teachers that um, are um, realizing extraordinary results that will and being able to teach a um, broader number of students while also mentoring and supporting other teachers. This is in support um, as well as I said in partnership with the University of Texas of the Permian Basin and its partner schools and it basically transforms the way that we prepare teachers by providing them a year-long year -long paid internship um, to work in our schools while they're also being supported by extraordinary teachers that are currently in the district as well as um, multi-classroom leaders. So Opportunity Culture is a model that's been developed by Public Impact. It provides greater teacher support, giving excellent teachers a chance to lead small teams for higher pay, which helps attract and develop new teachers. And this district's work will be a model for districts and education preparation providers nationwide, and also it will positively impact our teacher pipeline. This is another exciting innovation to promote recruitment, development, and retention within our district. Finally, as presented in this month's staffing update, two campuses um, have changes, and one of those campus leaders is here, and I want to um, take just a moment to recognize her. She's been a, an administrator in our district um, for several years. She started out as a, a supervisor in the special edu education department. Um, currently, she's an assistant principal at um, San Jacinto Junior High School. She has recently been named as the new principal at Fannin Elementary School, and that is Ms. Lisa Cisneros. Lisa Cisneros. Board members, this concludes our January 2020 staffing report. Are there any questions? I'd just like to make one observation relative to your opportunity culture presentation. I hope that uh, this will make a significant impact on those professionals that will participate in this, but more, more importantly, I think this is a step in the direction of responding to the criticism that we receive relative to our not treating our teachers properly. This is a good project. We're excited about it. I could probably go on and on. We spent two days last week in the district design session where we were really able to, to get grasp what all this means. And so this is going to put us um, in a great position to be able to compensate extraordinary teachers that we all know and uh, um, that can support te other teachers as well as more students and also compensate them for their knowledge and their reach to um, throughout the campuses um, throughout the district. So we're excited about it. An element just to share. So a teacher who is a... <coughs> 
starting teacher who needs to do a student internship can be paid while doing that internship as opposed to doing the internship and then having to work in the evenings or on weekends uh, because the internship is an all day internship. As well, if you're considered a master classroom level teacher, that's $20,000 that would be in addition to that responsibility at that level that a teacher would make on top of her salary or his salary. So does that include the, uh, uh, you know, if you're at the university and you're in your final year, you know, I don't know, so many hours left in the final year, and they do, uh, I know some of them have to do the, uh, in student teaching, or yes. is that is that different, the student teaching and internship part? So, so this is, as I mentioned, this is in partnership with DTTV, so they are transforming the way they're supporting their, what, what they call teacher residents. So instead of um, just one semester of student teaching, this will be an entire year that they will work with in our classroom, work with our teachers, with um, experienced teachers, multi-classroom leaders, while also being compensated. So that's going to increase the number of, of and students that are interested in, in entering the education field because in their senior year they can be fully compensated and not have to work in the evenings or you know take on another part-time job. So that's a positive revelation. Yeah, it's going to be rev revolutionary in, uh, in the impact. So it's a, it's a, it's awesome to hear good news. Is, do I understand you say that it'll be part of the requirement for a UTPB education student to get, to have an internship, or is just just an opportunity available? So their program will require a year long. Now I'm, I'm not sure, and I don't want to speak for UTPB. Our conversations have been that this is the, the direction that they're going with all of their students that are in the education program. That this will be their model for a year long student residence or teacher residence. So um, they're, they're I don't believe. They will have any that will um, remain on the old traditional model of a semester of student teaching. And they're going to move all their students over to this model. Do you? This sounds great. Do you yet know how many? Uh internships we might expect for the next school year? So we, we began that conversation last week. Um, currently, they have the number of elementary, those that are EC through six, um, and that's probably we can expect to receive somewhere in the range of 12 to 14 student residents in our district um, as they grow their program. But that's currently the number. Now, when you talk about secondary, those students are currently in math courses or they're in a science subject area, so it's hard to tell the actual number numbers that will be prepared and ready to enter um, a student residency next year. Whatever numbers they are, they're in addition to the 12 or 14 that you estimate yes. at the yes. elementary level? Yes. All right, great. I do have a question, uh, Mr. Bailey. Have, have, I know, know we've talked about it in the past, but um, maybe still uh, maybe bring it to the forefront on having, uh, uh, whether it's teachers or, or uh, our support staff, maybe on recruitment of, of teachers and having some type of incentive uh, for teachers that recruit teachers. Uh, I think that would be a, an opportunity as well because teachers do network and as well as our maintenance. I just think it'd be an opportunity uh, uh, for a win-win for, for the district and for that teacher and employee that might be able to recruit uh, the teachers to the district as well. Absolutely, and we are, have plans to present that and you'll hear about more about that in our board workshop as we prepare next year's budget. Uh, there's something else that's not on here, but the anonymous uh, phone line deal for our teachers, you know? Yes. And I just want to commend you on that. And, uh, you know, just, it's another thing that, you know, just it's just another thing that, you know, accolade for the district, for your department that I've been working on. And uh, so, uh, there's just so many things that are done, it's, it's hard to stand up here and jump up and down every board you know, to put them out, but there is a, uh, there's continual work being done to, to improve uh, any communication that somebody wants to communicate on uh, with the district. So, thank you for that. Thank you. Any questions? Anything else for Mr. Bailey? Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, next at the district report is the first reading of local policy revision EHBB local, EIC local, and TASB's updates 111-114. The information begins on page 204 of our meeting packet. 
Mr. Thank Horner, you. welcome back. Thank you, sir. President Davis, board members, Ben Riddick, there are multiple um, policy updates that you'll see before you. Um, we've had two board policy committee meetings to look at these updates over a period of, uh, of a couple of weeks uh, prior to this. I'd like to elaborate first on recommendations from Vance uh, Academics Office for EHBB Local. So the gist of the changes recommended in the HPV local change um, how we look at students as they come into the district um, based on GT services. Um, the current policy, which is uh, given to you in the memo and then you're back in blue, basically says that we accept what is given to us when they say they're GT and they come in. The recommended policy, gives us more leeway, flexibility, and um, ability to respond more quickly um, in order to provide services. Um, so it is our recommendation under the first reading that the board consider this um, EHPB local changes. I'd like to stop there and then uh, possibly if there's questions on EHPB before we proceed. Are we uh, making a, a motion per item or? No, no. this is a report okay. only, first oh. reading. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. It is our uh, next month. It's our wish that uh, today's first reading and uh, we'll revise, uh, take input as needed from the board, uh, anyone else, and bring it back for a possible motion in February. Any questions on the HPB? Or you uh, lots in this. I'd like to move on to EIA local. So EIA local is um, the full packet is where we look at rank, um, GPA, all sal, etc. What we're asking is to add a clause in EIA local specific to young women's leadership in the future and early college high school uh, now. Um, that we do not rank students outside of the top 10% on their transcript. This is um, e EIC, EIC local, right? It is EIC. I'm so sorry. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Thank you. My apologies. So, current policy um, states we rank 100% of our students at every campus. Um, by law, we're only required to rank the top 10%. It's our contention that by adding this clause, we'll make our students graduating from our more competitive high schools, um, you know, where nearly 100% of them go on to a four-year university, college uh, um, acceptance, those kind of things, that we don't necessarily rank them on their transcripts. The example I would give, and I've given several times, if I'm um, 48 out of 50 at early college high school, I've got my associate's degree, However, um, my, my transcript says I'm 48 out of 50 when I'm uh, being uh, considered for scholarships and application to four year university. It does not look as uh, positive as if it were simply not there. Um, we're required to do the first five in that case, so the top 10%, but we're not required, so we ask that you consider the clause um, that will allow us to not rank those students. I'll also add that this is um, in line with the majority of districts in the state. We looked at multiple policies, um, um, camps, especially early college high schools and uh, very high level college level uh, programming um, have this clause in there. I assume that this was a, this is something that was organic from the early college high school parents or students? Yes, we, we hear from parents and students pretty regular, and um, this, this did come about organically uh, as a reason. You notice we added young women because we predicted it would be the same um, problem, so. Okay. Um. All right, any other questions for Mr. Horner? We'll add, uh, you have four tests beyond dates, 111 through 114. There's over a thousand pages of policy. However, um, you'll see in the memo there the, the gist of those. Those have all been um, recommended through the TASB Policy Review Board. Um, and so we ask that you consider those changes as well. And they've been reviewed by the, pol the Board Policy Committee? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, sir. So TASB puts out the updates based on legal that come from law. And what they do is they recommend those changes to the local. Uh, what you're seeing on EIC and EHBB, those are unique policies that are unique to Midland that we're making updates to. Uh, going through the policy review committee, led by Mr. Horner, they reviewed all those policies uh, with an executive summary, and if needed, dove into the policy itself if they needed more clarification on are we okay with the changes that our policy consultant with TASB has recommended and has taken through her attorneys. These policies, once reviewed uh, next month, will go through that same process. Our policy consultant will then take those, review them, take them through an attorney, with TASB and then post them online for us once they give the clearance that it's all good. And the origin of those, I assume, were from the Texas legislative session? Is yes, that sir. The majority yeah, of that legislation is the multiple. Most of those updates are very specific last legislation. Okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Horner. Thank you. All right, now turning to our discussion action items, 7A, Texas Education Agency uh, Secure Environment System, and the Texas Education Agency Login Submitters. The information on page 215 of our meeting packet. Ms. Alanis, welcome back. If you Are you presenting again? Or just answering if we have any questions. Would you have any questions for me on this? Second. Motion by Mr. Trischetti, second by Mr. Murray. Any questions? All those in favor, raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Thank you. All right, next, our last action item for this evening before closed session is our Lone Star Governance Board quarterly evaluation. Uh, we have a walk-in sheet on that to supplement the prior information on page 217. If the board will allow me to use the same methodology we have in the past, and if there are four or more board members, a majority voting in favor of a number, and there's no disagreement or discussion about it, we accept that number. If we use, utilize that methodology, then uh, for this last quarter, ending in December, uh, vision 1 would be a score of 15, Vision 2 would be a score of 15, Vision 3 would be a score of 10, Vision 4 would be a score of 5, Accountability 1 would be a score of 4, Accountability 2 would be a score of 0.5, Structure would be a score of 4, Advocacy a score of 1, and Unity a score of 10, resulting in a total of 64 point five zero five even though one of those may be wrong you can put the consensus i think i think you're right on you <laughs> uh, i mean it may not matter well i'm i'm not following your point yet i mean you you envision it's 43 the rest of it's 42 I, I stand, I've reviewed it, and I stand corrected. 10, I believe, is the correct number. Okay. All right, moving on to the next quarter targets, utilizing the same methodology. Uh, vision 1, 15. Vision 2, 15. Vision 3, 10. Vision 4, 5. Vi accountability 1, 12. Accountability 2, 5. Accountability 2 is a score of 5. Structure is 4. Advocacy 9. Unity 10 for a score of 85. Any questions or discussion about that? All right. Uh, motion by Mr. Murray, second by Mr. Trischetti. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous, thank you. All right, it is now 7.03 p.m. We will go into closed session in accordance with government code sections 551.071 through .074, 551.076, 551.0821 .084. Thank you all very much for coming.
8.40 p.m. We are emerging from closed session to take up uh, action item 8A. Teacher contract abandonment, one, good cause did not exist for resignation, and two, complaint and request for sanction to TEA regarding K. Butler. I move. Motion by Mr. Marquez, second by Mr. Fuller. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Thank you. Let me see your right hand, James. Thank you. It's unanimous. All right. Uh, 9B, teacher contract abandonment. One, good cause did not exist for resignation. And two, complaint request for sanction of TEA regarding E. Morris. I move. Motion by Mr. Marquez. Anybody want... Anybody on second? Did you get those confidential? I'm lacking a second. Second by Mr. Trischetti. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Thank you. It is now 8.41 p.m. and we are adjourned. Thank you.